topic or a theme, and then based on the surveys, we'll be giving them at the end of the year, many questions were coming in about our theme this year with Heaven, Hell, and the Supernatural. And uh, before we set up, uh, John Bartbrook's going to come here in a minute, I want to just like set this up to like why this is important and what we're going to do. In the past, like um, as you get older and older, you see trends come and go, and in the past, there was a lot of talk, like when I first became a Christian and entered the church in my 20s, there's a lot of talk about life after death, heaven, hell, Satan, demons, uh, uh, and the end times. It was like, oh, you know, the rapture is going to happen any moment for those who know the rapture is. We, and then we for, often forgot about the importance of you know, following Jesus in this life. It wasn't just all about when we die, uh, and then you go to heaven. But then what's happened is a generation has grown up, for some of you in this room, and we kind of stopped talking about it. It's so interesting. I scan churches and I scan like, what are they talking about? And you don't see a ton talked about, about this. Not just, and if the churches aren't talking a ton about it the past 10 or 15 years, especially younger ages, then you grow up not knowing like much about heaven, hell, or the supernatural from the scriptures themselves. And for those that are part of churches, and I imagine most of you are, recognized, talked about, acknowledged as a place that's extremely unchurched to have uh, a group of people and many, many, many of you are on the front end of your life um, thinking about how do you devote yourself to the church and uh, that's a very encouraging thing and I'm really glad you're here. I love this topic. 
Uh, there's actually a really interesting book that I have been reading as it happens by a guy named Clay Rutledge. He's a psychologist uh, in, I think, North Dakota of all places. Um, but it's called Supernatural. And he writes in there about how uh, there's something in human beings that can never get away from our fascination with the supernatural. And questions like, is death really the end? And is there a transcendent sense of meaning in life or not? And he has all kinds of studies in that book that are quite fascinating around how there is something about believing in the supernatural and that there is hope beyond this world and that there is transcendent meaning for life that's actually uh, quite essential to human flourishing. And we have a difficult time getting away from it. And that in fact, people who do not believe in the God that Jesus talked about will often find themselves believing in uh, uh, paranormal activity or uh, aliens or transhumanism, the idea that technology will be able to one day defeat death. Because uh, as it was said a long time ago, God has set eternity in the hearts of human beings. And this topic about heaven is so fascinating. Uh, so for this session, I will give you heaven, and then Josh will give you hell. Uh, and, and our fascination with, uh, like, what would heaven be like? What would the afterlife be like? Why, what does all the imagery mean? How literally do we take that imagery? Uh, why does it often seem like heaven is this exclusive place in Christian thought? What about near-death experiences? Has science or neurology shown us that we're nothing but our brains and there is no such thing as afterlife? All these fascinating questions. And so I want to get into it actually by starting with the question that a man by the name of Dallas Willard asked years ago. The first time that I had heard it, I went to a Christian college and to a uh, terrific seminary, uh, but I had never thought about this question before. And it is, if somebody were to ask you, what is the gospel that Jesus himself proclaimed how would you respond? If you've grown up around churches, you probably have heard that word gospel quite a lot. It's a very common word. It gets talked about in a lot of different ways. But I never thought about it like this. If somebody were to ask you, what's the gospel that Jesus himself came to proclaim, what would you say? So if you don't mind, just take about 20 seconds, turn to somebody next to you, and take a shot at that question. What is the gospel that Jesus himself came to proclaim? Just right now, about 20 seconds. New covenant. I never thought about it. Most folks in most churches, at least in America, will not give the answer to this question that the Bible itself does. So I just want to go through a few different texts. You can jot down the references, take a look at them later if that's helpful. But at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had one message. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it's put like this. After John, John the Baptist, was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. That's the Gospel, the you on Galilee, the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now then Jesus chose his disciples and he adopted a strategy to proclaim his gospel, his good news, to everybody that he could. So this is Luke chapter 8, verse 1. After this, after he had chosen his disciples, Jesus traveled about from one town to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And then, when he sent his disciples out, he sent them out to proclaim one message. This is Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons. Interesting, given the topic of this day, and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Jesus was crucified after he rose from the dead. He spoke to his disciples about one topic, Acts chapter 1. Verse 3, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And the last glimpse that we have of the early church in the book of Acts, the last verse of the last chapter, Paul is proclaiming one truth. 
boldly and without hindrance, this is Acts 28, verse 31, boldly and without hindrance, Paul preached the kingdom of God. So now, if you were going to say what Jesus' gospel is about, in what phrase, what might that one phrase be? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And, and in the church where I grew up, that was kind of, you better to beam me up there. This earth is going to get torched, it's going to be destroyed. So we gotta beam me up so we can get out of here and go up there. That's not the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. He doesn't say, pray, oh God, oh God, oh God, get me out of here so I can go up there. He said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Kingdom is the reign of God's effective will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, oh God, oh God, oh God, make up there, come down here. Make up there, come down here. Starting in my body. Starting in my life. Starting particularly in my mind. Mostly you are a ceaseless flow of thoughts and desires and intentions that are embodied, so they mostly run on habit. God, make up there, come down here, starting with me in my body. And then my roommate, maybe, my family, maybe, my church, maybe, in this neighborhood. See, this is why the gospel of Jesus is about so much more than just getting individual souls from down here to up there. His gospel is the greatest offer that has ever been made available to the human race. The life in the kingdom of God, God's presence, God's forgiveness, God's love, God's justice, God's power, God's guidance, God's friendship is now available to you through Jesus, if you want it. And if you want it, then the natural response is to become his disciple. Not to earn your way into heaven, but because if you understand that the gospel is the availability of life in God's kingdom, the natural way to begin to experience it, absorb it, enter into it, is by becoming Jesus' disciple. And now we do that in this world where there are still lots of other kingdoms that are opposed to God's will. And that was the great surprise in Jesus' day. They thought that when the kingdom came, it would obliterate every other kingdom, all resistance by coercive power and violence. And Jesus did not do that. In fact, he came and he suffered for the sake of the kingdom. And so now, his kingdom is here, but there are many kingdoms that still oppose it, and therefore much pain and much suffering. One day, that will be gone. One day, there will only be God's kingdom. That will be when we will experience the ultimate goodness and joy of salvation. And it will be wonderful. And it will not be boring. Dallas used to say, if you want to think about the future, you should think of yourself being part of an unimaginably splendid team effort under inconceivably great leadership on an unbelievably fast scale with ever-increasing cycles of productivity and fruitfulness. And that is what I do. Buddy, what lab are you going to go to? Buddy, yeah. what lab are you going to? I, I don't know yet. I can't decide. Wait, wait, wait. Come here. Hey, Liz, what okay. lab are you going to? Demons. Oh, Justin, Demon right here. Where are you going? Oh, wait. You got Free book. Go get it. It's only 110. <laughs> hey, go get the free book. Baby, go get the free book. Coffee shop. Golden. What's up? Let's see what's up, man. What's up, guys? Shout out to your channel. Shout out to Mr. Oh. Me, my friend. That's <laughs> No, you can. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's two. Yeah. See, we're going to go to that one later. I'm going to go to We're at the Regeneration Project with Nathan and the gang. Carol. Did you just call Carl? No. Oh, my gosh. We are here. We're actually here at Milpitas. I was in Milpitas. And we're going to be learning about heaven, hell, evil, the dead, worship, everything, demons, and stuff like that. Let's see what the gang's up to. Where are you guys going? Josh, get away. Where are you guys going? This is our pretty girl, David. Right? But other than that, 
we're gonna go split up to classes right now and see which ones we are gonna go to. I think me and Carol are gonna go to the exorcism one and devil and Satan and all that good stuff. So get a glimpse of that. Be strong in the Lord. I'm gonna uh, stick around some various translation, mostly ESV, just cause uh, more literal translation. Be strong in the Lord and strong in the might. Put on the whole armor of God. You may stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he says this, verse 12, and this is kind of a theme. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not other humans, he's saying here. And what I'll suggest to you is human beings have been taken captive by the devil to do his will. That other human beings are part of the dominion of darkness, but they're not our problem. Our problem is at a higher level. Our problem is not the humans who are part of that, but against the, the rulers, authorities, causing cars of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. What's that? What are those? It doesn't mention Satan. Yeah, these are just, if you, if you, how many, just out of curiosity, how many listen to the Bible Project podcast? Okay, most of you. So you've heard Tim and John talking about the Elohim. Well, these are the Elohim. These are angels, angel level things, various orders, various hierarchies perhaps. And so that's what this is. These are angel level beings in the heavenlies, and there's a bad group and there's a good group of these Elohim. Okay, what are some names of the bad group? The Bible Project people, what are some names of the bad guys? Satan is not a name, Satan is a title. The devil is not a name, it's a title. What's the name of the number one chief bad dude? He doesn't have one. It, well, he probably has one, but it's not in the Bible. How come? I think it's a studied insult. I think it's a studied insult. We have names of other Elohim. Baal and Chemish and Moloch and Astarte and we've got a lot of names of them in the Bible but the number one dude only has titles just like who was the guy that was in charge of Egypt when Moses did a little what's his name see biblically his name is not there why he's an evil guy may his name ever be forgotten it's a studied insult I think Gary has opinions on everything occasionally I'm right he deceived, accused, or tempted, and they yield demonic attacks or gave the demons influence in their lives, though they don't have to. So to me, an important point, an evil spirit can empower, energize, encourage, and exploit a believer's only sinful desires, unbelief, weakness, and ignorance, and fear. I, I think that's what happens, is, is demons take advantage of our stuff. If that happens, I, I think what we do is come against the demon. Now, give me an example in Bible of a good and godly guy getting attacked by a demon. Job, I, I hate that book. We'll skip that one. <laughs> I have this incredible fascination with it, but I hate the book, so there it is. And it didn't give any easy answers. Job doesn't get any answers there. It does tell us how to suffer. I think the purpose of the book of Job is tell us how to suffer when we're under righteous person under suffering. And I think he does it really. That's a whole different seminar. Ask me to lunch, I'll go through it. Uh, who's a righteous guy that got attacked by a demon? Jesus. Where? In the wilderness. Okay, so if I come back to Matthew chapter 4, what happened right before Matthew chapter 4? Jesus baptized. Holy Spirit descends like a dove. You should hyperlink back to Genesis 1 there comes to rest on him, and the Father says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. What's the first thing he does after he's anointed to be Messiah? What's the first thing he does? He goes and faces the devil. Does that remind you of anything? I hope it reminds you of Eve, and Eve and I, in the garden. He's going back and redoing what happened in the garden, because we're slated to be sitting on the right hand of, at the right hand of God in the heavenlies, and we got usurped by a demon that a, a 
deceived Eve and does the same thing today. So Jesus goes back and he faces the devil. And the devil attacks, by the way, when it says, if you're the son of God, that's not doubt. That's a, if you know your Greek, that's a first class condition, not a third class condition. You translate that meaning wise, you'd say, because you are the son of God. Jesus is not doubting his divine sonship. Because you're the son of God, take, uh, use your divine characteristics for personal comfort. See, that would be sin. Well, Regenerators, I'm happy that you got to join us on part one of the little uh, regeneration program, oh, regeneration project uh, conference that we had. You should go check out video number two because it's even better. So go ahead and check it out. If you don't check it out, we understand these videos are pretty long and sometimes we don't have the time to do it. But I want to remind you that this Wednesday, if you want to join us, we're going to have game night on the 31st. It's our little contribution to the community that there's other things better than Halloween that people usually go celebrate because it's a pagan holiday that we don't do it. So we invite people to come over to our church for game night and have a healthy little worship night as well with us. So if you're not doing anything on Wednesday, the 31st, which is today, yeah, which would be today where the video releases, then come and join us tonight at 7 o'clock. We can't wait to see you. Peace out, guys.